Hi guys, uh, my name is Kamal Verma. I work for Dow Jones, and uh, I am responsible for cloud security. Primarily, uh, there are various aspects of security that, uh, that I'm responsible for, but we're gonna talk about the perimeter protection and how we got here in, in one and a half or two years that we are trying to protect our legacy applications as well as the new greenfield applications. So in this talk, I'm gonna quickly go over what we do as Dow Jones, and if uh, you folks don't know about Dow Jones, Dow Jones is the leading news, financial news provider, and we own a lot of institutional as well as the consumer products like Factiva, WSJ, MarketWatch, Barons, and News Plus. And working there, primarily I'm responsible for one aspect of this is where we work with the enterprises, large enterprises like institutions. So it's not directly consumer related. So one of the key aspect of that is the performance. So all our large enterprises not only want the security, but also wants the performance. So we will be looking at that aspect. And I'll get over a specific aspect of that is then um, why performance is important and how we handle that. So quickly going over how and why perimeter security. So giving an analogy, uh, if we have a fence around our house, the ideally everybody who's getting inside that fence we examine and we talk to the person, we examine whether they are a threat or not. Similarly, we want to surround our enterprise applications that are, uh, that, that needs protection. And, and one of the key decision regarding, regarding whether to surround them with the perimeter, a secure perimeter, or to basically write it or regard it or rewrite it, is that there are a lot of legacy applications that cannot be changed overnight. So you need to examine all the traffic that is going on uh, and coming out. And with that, it provides us a good monitoring as well. So every packet, every HTTP packet or any uh, traffic that is going to the application get examined uh, on the fly and matched against the pattern using WAF. And then um, it's, then uh, also it creates a lot of logs that we uh, process offline. That's another aspect I wanted to talk about. So when we have a traffic that we are trying to protect against, we are not only, uh, not only actually examining the the payload for various threats, but also we are adding additional delays. So in that case, we do offline processing. Then being nimble is another aspect of uh, uh, this project or this uh, perimeter security so that we are able to put our resources into new greenfield applications versus trying to put a lot of effort on legacy applications. Application security, operational security, then along with this comes the certificate management uh, that we have tied in. Then various operation aspects like inclement state, my application is stop working. So those things are also comes for free, having a perimeter. Advanced seam, and then standardizing on error pages. So if you're surrounding um, various applications with this perimeter. And if any of the, any of the customer receiving a lot of errors, we are able to uh, standardize that experience and other stuff. So not only the security, but also the other operational aspects that we take care of that. Um, today's agenda, we're gonna probably try to go through the layer four, how we do the layer four security, how we do the layer seven, and then monitoring and uh, logging. Uh, processing out of band, abuse processing and reporting, then uh, Lambda on the edge uh, for JOT validation and things of other 
uh, other customized uh, threat protections that we are trying to do. And also as a part of uh, this project, uh, we are also trying to move uh, to simplified patterns of applications. So not only we are surrounding the appli uh, current applications with this perimeter protection, but we are also trying to take all that feedback and put it into the application, trying to revise those applications, try to see how the new green fuel. Um, internally, we call this project as a Project Saturn. Um, for the layers or the, uh, the rings that forms around the Project Saturn or the planet Saturn. So anything that comes in the ray get uh, squashed, and I'll put up a picture to imagine. But um, imagining this, uh, what we're trying to do is like in a global sense, uh, the cloud front and the web application firewall, these are global products, AWS products that we are trying to use. And uh, along with goes the shield and advanced shield um, that we have. We have these, these layers distributed around the uh, globe and they kind of form a ring. And to which end they are layered. So layering would come, layering would come is the first is uh, the layer three protections where we use advanced shield. The way we not only, or not only enable on our all the applications, but also we have baked into our uh, landing zones. So various landing zones that we create uh, have already uh, advanced shield enabled on the CloudFront properties. Then the next layer of the WAF, uh, once it passes that, layer seven protections, we have customized uh, WAF rules uh, that we have created. Um, and then CloudFront cache comes in a picture and essentially we are using CloudFront for caching and performance so any application, uh, legacy or otherwise, that needs the uh, edge location or needs to have a cache available closer to the customer browser, then we are uh, using that. And then comes the Jot Lambda. So anything, anything, anything that is not handled by Advanced Shield, WAF, or our CloudFront, we are uh, handling those using customized Lambda. We have various use cases where we are using this. We are also using Lambda for, say, a new vulnerability get found, and uh, the one way to exploit it is uh, sending a XYZ payload in your cookie. So we will be able to quickly uh, write that in a Lambda, if not in the WAF, and handle it there. So all these layers are kind of sandwiched and tightly knit so that uh, the so that they are handing over the packet, the data packet that is arriving from customer to the application and then filtering it out. To the, this, this is the protection, but also we need to look at the logs, we need to look at the various alerts and alarms that are going on. And I'll quickly go over each layer uh, in a bit and how we communicate that. So there are many use cases that we're using here. There are many abuse cases that we are handling, trying to protect against those abuse cases but few of them I'll talk about that and them here. So one of the things that uh, we have to do is in case of anything happens, the, the team needs to know about it and it has to be told quickly. So one of which is the, the, the inclement state alarms or any ongoing attack or any um, alarm uh, that, is, uh, that is occurring because of the uh, scripts some scripts are uh, running against your property. So that we are able to identify and quickly send it to the team using Slack. Well, currently we are using Slack, but it also wires into our uh, operations and operations get notified and escalated uh, uh, properly that is needed. And uh, I'll go over like how we communicate uh, with Slack and other stuff the next. Um, Next stuff is like a very important uh, aspect that we wire. WAF, we cannot write like all the abuse cases in our WAF. Reason being is every request will be examined and it will be burdened. So it needs to be adjusted depending upon how current traffic patterns are going on. 
So for that, uh, we created a mechanism where we used the WAF logs that are getting processed on the fly using Kinesis Firehose and Lambda to process that and use the Kinesis Analytics application. Try to identify those, means I would not say offline, but they are not participating in the, in the, in the request response path. So, and that constantly adjusts our, our WAF for the protections that we want for that specific threat that has arrived. So, I'll go over a little bit of abuse cases and why those are important and why the current mechanisms are not working in there and why we had to do that. So the other thing is also be if any of the abuse cases that um, get presented then uh, is shared with the team via Slack or other communications that we have by this aspect. Then another aspect of your web application is something happened at 12 a.m. You want to be able to do postmortem later in the, in the day when you arrive at work. So in that case, we use uh, the CloudFront logs that get dumped directly into S3 bucket, and then we use Athena directly on the S3 to query. Um, query really what happened. And also, I'll go over that Kinesis Firehose uh, also get dumped into S3 that get uh, searched uh, using Athena, and uh, we do kind of postmortem there. And uh, the, let me quickly, okay. So let me talk about a little bit about WAF. Um, so everybody knows that, uh, say, SQL injection, XSS, and uh, other vulnerabilities that get identified in uh, OWASP top 10 uh, related vulnerabilities, we created specific uh, rules. And these rules get uh, implemented in WAF using the current uh, constructs that we have with AWS that it provides. But anything other than that get handled in the Lambda on the edge if it is not. Uh, one of the mechanisms that we use is that WAF is not a just a static thing once you create it and then forget about it and uh, uh, you will be protected forever. You need to make sure that the WAF is constantly tendered at and uh, modified for the emerging threats, as well as, uh, as well as anything specific that you want to uh, block. So in any enterprise, a large enterprise, you have multiple accounts, and you need to spread this across uh, multiple, uh, multiple instances of CloudFront properties that is, it is associated with. And each time you touch the WAF, it is likely that it can potentially impact your current running application. So you cannot uh, just willy-nilly uh, modify WAF and expect your application working. So in that case, we have the rules, all the rules written in Terraform, and that get run against each landing zone, and this modifies the, uh, that specific landing zone's WAF for a specific property. But another aspect of that is uh, before we could do that, we need to test all the applications that are going to use that new version of WAF to be able to see whether they are, uh, they are able to do their normal business or we are stopping any regular um, request and response pattern that used to work in the previous version. To that end, we have automated tests against the application. We uh, modify the WAF in a specific non-production uh, landing zones, and then we run these battery of tests um, that uh, basically tell us how many requests uh, were denied or how many requests uh, were let through. Uh, current implement, our current implementation is uh, using OWASP top 10, and now 
we are working on OWASP uh, top 10 2017 version. So there's specific uh, rules uh, that you can uh, code. And these are, these are using Amazon standard rules that are, uh, we have and uh, customizing them to our needs. Um, for certain things, we, um, so one specific uh, rule, if you guys have used, is the rate control. And I'll tell you why we cannot effectively use rate control in a enterprise applications like ours. So uh, let me quickly go over that aspect in, uh, in a moment, which is uh, this one. So in the enterprise application, even if you think it is a larger enterprise application, all of your traffic will go from your netted IP addresses. So current uh, constructs of AWS, WAV, provides that you uh, specify the rate controls and it, it relies on IP address as the rate controlee, I would say. So we cannot do that in uh, enterprise because most of our traffic is going from a single IP. For that, what we do is primarily we examine, we have identified the various, um, various transactions that we need to protect. Say something like login slash login is in your application you want to protect. And you don't want your customer, or you will need to see whether the customer is logging, say, 50 times a day. That may be a normal thing, but they're not logging 10,000 times a day. If they're trying to log in 10,000 times a day, then it's a problem. Or they're logging too many times, that is going to sap your resources and uh, produce a, a denial of service attack uh, kind of scenario. So in this case, we try to use is um, unauthenticated sessions. Instead of relying on IP address, we rely on uh, special unauthenticated session that gets set. So any, any, any browser that gets pointed to our application gets an unauthenticated session cookie. And that we process uh, using Kinesis Lambda. So we extract that Kinesis Lambda cookie and uh, run through analytics application, identify that offending uh, unauthenticated session and uh, block that in the WAF. So uh, see the orange loop basically taking that and uh, doing that, uh, doing the blocking part. So IP rate controls fail in this because uh, all of our abuser punishes all the users of that organization. And read auto traffic is not controlled. So if we have certain IP and it get, uh, our traffic get rerouted because of some X, Y, Z reason, then uh, they will not be triggering these rate controls. Unauthenticated session we talked about uh, is processing that, identifying that specific uh, unauthenticated session and blocking that using the WAF. Then another aspect is say one, once this unauthenticated session become authenticated, we tie them together uh, with a signed JOT. So it is built into that so we know who that person is and who, who is trying to use our APIs uh, more, than it is, more than it is intended for. The other aspect uh, that we try to do is um, abuse case that we try to uh, mitigate is the bot. So I mean, I mean see, this is not a general bot protection or general uh, things, but we have identified like various ways that we want to identify these uh, bots with. So all of that is coded in a lambda that gets runs uh, at the fire cause kinesis and triggers a pattern that makes an adjustment in our our WAF and then that, uh, uh, that basically uh, blocks that also. So uh, these are two leading abuse cases, but then there are other abuse cases uh, that can be written. Each one of would have its own lambda that gets triggered by Kinesis Firehose uh, 
application um, and will, uh, will trigger or make adjustments in your WAF on the fly to block that. And the, the good part of uh, this is that we, we are not participating in the re request response. This is happening as a off processing, offline processing um, in there. So another uh, quick aspect that I wanted to talk about was that um, when we are when we are doing a postmortem of the application, or postmortem of an incident, or creating automated incidents uh, that we have, um, all the logs that WAF is generating, they are dumped into the S3 bucket as well as the CloudFront uh, logs get uh, into the bucket, and we use Athena, and we have canned queries for various. Uh, various aspects that we want to extract about our applications, and we run them on a regular basis using Lambda. Um, whenever they, once a day they run, and they dump uh, their output to the Slack channel that we look at, and we kind of identify whether some adjustment needs to be made or not. So this is another aspect, and the, the good part of uh, being a simple SQL query, like select example, and where time taken is more than four. So we want to know the uh, analyze application slowness or analyze applications, other aspects, or it can be any uh, complicated aspect of that. So other is various alarms um, that we have created, and each one of uh, Lambda, so maybe we have about, uh, about 10 or so abuse cases that are directly built into this uh, layer. And each of these generate alarms. So some of them are like batch, like daily, and they get dumped into the Slack at the moment. But, uh, uh, but we have um, online adjustment that we talked about in a WAF also. And also these get, uh, get raised to the operations. Uh, this is something uh, um, what a person in a Slack channel uh, sees uh, once they receive an alarm. Uh, one, uh, this is one of like inclement state alarm that uh, we send out to the team that, okay, your application is under attack or your application is receiving XYZ ma a number of errors and thus do something about it. Um, the the best part of um, integrating directly with the team is that, say, in, in scenario when your customer started receiving, say, 500 error, your server backend EC2 is down for out of memory or something like that, then you want to quickly find out and do something about it. It may not be an easy fix, and currently the application team owner may not be looking at the logs, their application logs. They might not be looking at various uh, uh, things that they have built into the application. Or because it is out of memory, it is not communicating with the team itself. So this gives a firsthand um, experience, a user experience, before actually user calls in and reports a problem to the team directly in that channel. So it will. Um, code them with the ad channel, and everybody will receive that notification on their phone as well as in their things. The next thing I quickly wanted to talk about in this is that uh, when we are doing perimeter protection, one of the aspects of the uh, uh, this creating a secure perimeter is not only just the perimeter, but also the underlying applications. So we took all this uh, feedback and tried to simplify our um, application pattern. And when we say that, uh, by simplification, the traditional applications uh, had various, various shortcomings. And, and I'll quickly go over um, with that. So the first thing is there are a lot of moving parts. And a lot of moving parts, anywhere anything goes wrong, then the developer or responsible team is constantly chasing um, all the parts. What is happening in the browser? What is happening 
in the cloud front or what is happening in the load balancer. And usually the logs currently are not tied unless you, unless you do that uh, separately. Then if you have, say, something like Nginx or uh, EC2, whatever is running on EC2. Also, since we need to comply with the data in transit uh, compliance requirement, so all the data that uh, data at rest, data in transit needs to be encrypted. So to that end, we have various TLS certificates. Each one of them is talking to other uh, layer in here. So there are two, three problems here, a lot of moving parts, the TLS certificate hygiene. So what, do you mean, what I mean by that, if you remember, uh, in the traditional data center applications, uh, all the certificate are downloaded and somewhere uh, the developer downloads it, uh, removes the password, then puts the certificate with a private key. So the private key is sitting in the uh, developer's machine, or sometimes they do not know and it can be compromised very easily. So one of the things we wanted to do away with that is use uh, Amazon ACM. Amazon ACM service uh, never shares the private key with anybody. Uh, it gets directly injected into whatever application that is going to use. And the uh, only thing you have is access to the pro uh, public key. And other aspect of that is like how many times we run into uh, an enterprise incident where, oh, certain certificate expired. So the beauty of Amazon ACM certificates is that um, they auto-renew as long as the parameters of the auto-renewal are in place. So currently we have automated this process end-to-end -end where we, the certificates are issued, issued to the team that requires uh, automatically and they are validated by our team automatically or uh, if there is a manual validation that gets handled by the other team if it need to be. So this overall improves our uh, communication hygiene, I would say, because loss of a private key would be a total compromise of the traffic. And also we eliminated uh, the new pattern that uh, like, a, I'll take a various example um, I have for application, but one of the examples of application is simple website or simple single page app that we try to serve from web server. Um, maybe it a Node.js application, maybe it uh, IIS uh, application. But uh, uh, we created a simplified pattern where we eliminated uh, various moving parts. So in this scenario, this pattern is like CloudFront directly serving to the, the browser and picking up from S3. In this scenario, nobody, no moving part, any like uh, no, no EC2 instance or no computer or no load balancer is needed. It directly gets served. So we created a pattern that, or evolved to this pattern in, uh, for the single page applications. The benefit of uh, this is that uh, it is globally distributed. So uh, if I say that, um, once you dump or once you put the files, the, say, for example, let's pick up um, a React static, file, uh, React static application or a JavaScript application um, into S3, it gets uh, delivered by CloudFront. And one of the good aspects of that is a, uh, it can have multiple origins. So in scenario of disaster recovery, uh, it will automatically flip to the nearest S3 bucket. And with the current availability numbers for S3, it's very easy to assume it's gonna be uh, available a lot more than what I can put together in my EC2 instance. So, and what it provides is that uh, not only the availability, but the closer to uh, the user. And when I say closer to user, I will go over that uh, aspect in it, like a performance is uh, 
traditionally, when we look at the HTTP or TCP, when we are like a client server application where we're serving an application on web, we think it in this way and we do not factor in a, like a, even a millisecond or something like that. So this is compounded by HTTPS, like when we want to have data in transit. So behind the scenes in the HTTPS, there are a lot of, lot of communication happening. A lot of steps uh, get involved. Like TCP protocol comes in a picture. It has its own exchange of packets then followed by certificate and uh, certificate um, handshake that happens. And then actual HTTP uh, comes in a picture and then it does the aspect. So even if I say, like if we add like few milliseconds to each step, it's gonna be times so many steps. So that's why it is very important for our data or or application to live as close to the user. So in remote part of the world, your application will be served by that remote server, remote CloudFront application server or remote S3 bucket. So the, the aspect of, um, no, so, so the performance uh, as well as the security of this application one second, I got it. Um, for this application, we're a single page application. We do not need to have various moving parts uh, behind the scenes. Another aspect is the disaster recovery. And when we say disaster recovery, just in case uh, if uh, a data center goes out, or just in case uh, uh, Virginia data center is out, or the availability zone is out where your application is out, uh, 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 hosted. In that scenario, the, the good part of uh, CloudFront is that it's able to basically um, automatically fail over to your DR site and pick up the data from uh, that location. So currently in CloudFront, there, are, uh, there is a way to configure, configure origin groups you specify like how many uh, different origins. You specify I have uh, a Virginia origin, I have Oregon origin, and they can be formed in a group, and I'll be serving from that group. That said, what really happens is um, whenever the request comes in a, request comes from the user, that request is held open until we find one of the regions that is able to serve this. And with that, I will be open to taking any questions.